Huh? Right, it's almost a time, and today we are very happy to invite Dr. Liang and the Mr. Ivy Borge to attend our lecture to give the lecture um, modernity of the uh, Chinese art in the 20th century. So right now, just allow me to present Mr. Ivy Borge to say something before the lecture. It is an honor for me to introduce this lecture and i would like to welcome our members and friends, um, to this event perhaps the first uh, in 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 this um in our program um i would like to uh, introduce uh, the lecturer first and then say a few words about uh, contemporary art. Um, the lecturer, Dr. Liang Shuhan, art critic, editor-in-chief of Ren Dian magazine of Hong Kong, China, is a PhD in art history of Peking University, junior chair of the 34th World Congress of Art History. He lectures at Tianjin Normal University, China. Um, the title, a very interesting title, Modernity and Art in 20th Century China, um, should interest us um, very closely as through the China Cultural Center, Malta, we have had uh, so many exhibitions, collections, of modern art, chi modern Chinese art in Malta, and therefore we can uh, relate, we can connect with this topic. And uh, naturally, uh, in the modern world, words uh, at times lose their significance, their meaning, and I'm um, really uh, I'm referring to large words like truth, democracy, justice, reality, originality, especially originality, creativity. Um, man invents words about, um, about I, an idea, about ideals that do not really exist. There, there is no absolute originality. It's only relative. And therefore, we should relate to the lecture, keeping in mind that many words we use in art are not objective words, but relative. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, Mr. Ive Borge, very generous uh, introduction. And uh, that is, uh, that is exactly the point of, of, of my uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here, uh, to be invited to give a lecture. Um, but I'm sorry, this is my first time to use Zoom. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, maybe. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. If, if you can't hear me, anyone, just stop and uh, let me know because you know, I I'll have this connection problem. So yeah, it's my first time to use Zoom, but uh, to be honest, I don't have a sense of our presence because I can't see all of you in 3D. I, I just said I have a very great and vivid memory of your uh, Sponsioni Cleata Veta, is that right? In 2018, when I curated the show there for Mr. Yang Zhiling and uh, another show for Mr. Zhang Tingchun at uh, the China Culture Center. Uh, Matisse to me is, is a great people of hospitality and people of true appreciation of art, like Henry Matisse, because these two sound similar, the French art master. Maybe I have met some of you in person last time when I, when I uh, went to Malta, or maybe we will meet after all of this pandemic is over. I hope we uh, soon have a uh, vaccine to bring an end to this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, I really want to visit Malta again. Thank you. Uh, for two reasons, I decided to present this topic 
First, I studied American abstract art in early 20th century for my uh, PhD uh, research, my PhD dissertation at uh, Peking University uh, some years ago, uh, which gives me a chance to take a reflective view of what took place in my own country during the same uh, time period. Second, I feel that Chinese art is mostly talk about outside China in the sense of classical art, is that right? Like ink and wash painting, uh, calligraphy, uh, architecture. So that the 20th century Chinese art is much uh, eclipsed in both the academic world and in the general public sphere. It is true if you look for uh, literature on the 20th century Chinese art, um, on, for example, Amazon.com or any public libraries, there are some, but not in abundance, like that of Chinese ancient art. You can find lots, lots of literature on the, on the scholarship on Chinese uh, ancient art. So before we talk about such, I flipped the page, I fl can you see it? Yes. I flipped the page. Thank you. Um, so before we talk about such an abstract idea as the modernization of uh, art in China, I'd like to kick off by sharing something more uh, concrete and more, more uh, specific, as you know. Uh, this is one of my recent uh, research articles, the images of modern transportation in Chinese New Year uh, pictures. The case of Tianjin uh, Yang Liu Qin. Uh, New Year picture is the festival picture in the old times that people put on the doors or, or windows during Chinese Lunar New Year. I guess you all have, a, have an idea of Chinese Lunar New Year, like the play of dragon, like a drama play, fireworks, right? Uh, with with uh, these pictures are often uh, uh, executed with the topics, themes, with auspicious themes like wealth, uh, longevity, uh, fertility, uh, happiness. Uh, but the emphasis is always on uh, money, as you will see. I will show you because, because money talks and, and because Tianjin, the Tianjin local culture is very down to earth, direct and, and, and simple. Uh, by the way, this article will be adapted into a documentary film which will be screened on CCTV9, uh, documentary channel, CCTV9. So why I chose Yang Liuqing is a very representative case of what, uh, of the process when modernization came into China, especially into the, into the popular uh, cultural system. Yang Liuqing is actually a town just 10 kilometers from where I am now in Tianjin just 10, 10 kilometers away. And Tianjin is a coastal city in North China, just half an hour by, uh, by bullet train. There's a bullet train available between uh, Tianjin and Beijing, just half an hour. Beijing is the capital, that's right. Tianjin has become a treaty port in 1860, which is among the first Chinese cities open to the West, open to like Great Britain, America, Japan, and exposed to the Western and uh, modern influence. Uh, there's no problem hearing me, right? Very yes, clear. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yang Liuqing started to th to thrive in the early as as far as early 17th century in the Qing Dynasty uh, because of the New Year painting business. There appeared to be so many gallery shops selling New Year paintings. Like I'm talking about in in billions of copies. So they had a uh, competition over originality, uh, business. They all tried to create competing each other with uh, coming up with new schemes to attract every young generations um, for people put on the walls and, walls and windows um, during the Lunar New Year. So the well-established ones often hired or, or worked with famous artists and illustrators to come up with new uh, compositions. For example, in the year 1903, New Year Picture Reformation Movement was called by the then 
Cultural Ministry, and it was followed by a number of galleries in Yang Liuqin. The emphasis are mostly new values like sexual equality, uh, education right for women, uh, modern life, and I, I found uh, some pictures of modern transportation. By modern transportation in Yang Liuqin New Year painting, I mean something like this. This is supposed to be a very traditional uh, way of uh, traditional form of art, but then you see a car. A car is a, a, a object of modernity, right? You see two kids dressed in the traditional Chinese costume for the new year, but instead of uh, uh, sitting in the um, sedan or, or whatever traditional, but they're sitting in a car, right? For example, um, car, this is, this is the first uh, car, Ford Model T. I found most of the cars in Yang Liuqin New Year painting is based on Ford. Ford is the American car brand, Ford Model T. Ford Model T is the first uh, mass produced car uh, from the assembly line. Of course, Ford is the not inventor of a car, but inventor of a car is like a Benz or, or, or Rolls Royce. From the assembly line from, was produced from 1908 to uh, 1927. And why the artist chose to depict a car in his painting, I guess part of the reason is, is a car uh, advertisement in the symbol for the new rich the newly rich. Uh, this is the first car advertisement in China. It appeared in a newspaper in Shanghai in 1917. The message embodied in this image is, is something like the upper class happiness, especially in uh, the material sense. So uh, this is a car uh, Chevrolet sold at uh, like 1,250 liang of silver. Liang is the unit for money. I don't know how much it is, but uh, it must be an astronomical figure for ordinary people. Even now I can't afford it because it's a museum object, right? It's, it's something for, <laughs> for the auction. So if you look this, can you, okay, I flipped the page. Yes. Can you see, okay, I flipped the page. There's a time lag. For example, the print depicts Ford Model T. What's in the middle is a Ford Model T. Again, the title is something like, uh, come on in, big fortune, or come on in, big money, big happiness. Because like I said, Tianjin folk culture is very down to earth, plain and, and direct. Uh, but what's really tricky here is that, uh, sorry, if you look, closely and carefully enough, you may find the perspective used to depict the sedan car is not very correct. Like if you know uh, Renaissance perspective, right? It's not very, very correct. Actually, the car here is used to, to replace the sedan. Uh, it narrates something like the son of the family went to the city to do a business and make the big fortune and bought the car and packed up with the with the, uh, silver ingots, silver ingots like this, and came home for the Lunar New Year. It's uh, you know the car is all packed up with the silver ingots and came back to it's like a big uh, show off to his to his neighbors. And if you look at the doors of the car, they're not car doors. They are, they are doors of traditional Chinese house. Look at the cars. Can you see the cursor? Yes. yes. They are not car doors. They are doors of traditional Chinese house. So we can see how a modern element is used in the, in the local context and got transformed in the public consciousness in the early uh, 20th century. Um, sedan is still used for a wedding for the bridegroom to take the bride, but uh, it's more of a, a ritual property instead of the real vehicle. Uh, again, let me show you another picture with 
uh, Ford Model T. Sorry. There we go. Uh, Ford Model T appears in an even more traditional uh, auspicious format in the very traditional persona personification, the God of Wealth from the Taoist tradition, the Taoist system, isn't in a car to give a blessings. Uh, taking the goddess child is uh, taking him around to give a blessings. And the people are standing by their doors, uh, bowing to receive the message. You see, this is an, another uh, variation of Ford T model, right? But perhaps the most prominent uh, symbol of the industrial era is train, if you know uh, modern art history or, or the history of modern culture. Can you see the picture of the train? I flipped it. Okay. Yes. And here's, here's another Yang Liuqing New Year painting involving the motif of a train and, and, and the train station. But this picture is very tricky. Now, I want to cite... Uh, theorist, uh, the American theorist Daniel Bell in his, uh, in his book, The Coming of Post-Industrial Society. He classified the human civilization, human society into three categories, the pre-industrial society, industrial society, and the post-industrial society. By pre-industrial society, he means, you know, especially the competition between man and the nature, like a wine industry, sugar industry. And uh, industrial society is man between, between man and the uh, mechanical uh, industrial civilization. And the post-industrial society is something like now, uh, we're dealing with, with uh, information. So the modern uh, is the sense of industrial society and the modern art is the visual representation of industrial uh, sense. This picture is supposed to depict the uh, Tianjin train station, as uh, some scholars, many people believe. Okay, so um, please enter in, so it's okay right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, like I said, some people believe this This is a depiction in the New Year painting, the train station of Tianjin, because Tianjin is about the first cities to have a train and, and the train station, right, between Tianjin and Beijing. But what made me suspicious is the architecture style in the upper right corner. Everybody, please see here. Upper right corner. It's a typical Southern uh, architectural style instead of that uh, Northern style. Tianjin is a Northern Chinese city. But this, you will see this architecture is called a Ma Tou Qiao in Southern China. In fact, it is nothing to do with Tianjin. The prototype is a print from a pictorial in Shanghai. This one, can you, can you see it? This picture appeared in the Dian Shi Zhai pictorial Shanghai in, in Shanghai in the year 1884, representing the first railroad Wusong line initiated by Jordan Matheson Group. Jordan Matheson Group is, is one of the founders of Hong Kong and it's still operating. It's a very big uh, company with the businesses in all sectors. Of, uh, in all sectors. It was built, the railroad was built in 1876. Only a year later, in the year 1877, it was dismantled for some reasons. So it was operated, functioned for only one year. However, even this print is not original. It derived from a color print. This one, yeah. This was a time, this was, a, was a, a something like a timetable or a train schedule, okay? Supposed to put on the wall of a waiting room of a train station. The train was first, uh, like anywhere else, like in, in England or, or in France, it was first stigmatized by the public as something, you know, like a monster, like a, the roar, uh, because you need to add coal to the, to the engine. So people think it's a monster, uh, even caused uh, the public panic because, you know, 
because the image of it, mankind had never seen something like this industrial monster. But then gradually and eventually has become a symbol of the speed and the power and advancement. That, that explains why its image was appropriated into the folk popular culture as something novel uh, and progressive as exemplified in the Yang Liuqing uh, picture. But here, uh, this is a very rare New Year painting. Can you see the picture of the jet? Oh, can you see? Yeah, yeah. This rare New Year picture depicting an airship uh, flying over people's head with people applauding on the ground. Again, this is not a document or, or a record of any true event took place in Tianjin, but another appropriation from a picture appeared in uh, La Petite Journal or Little Journal in Paris. Here. The reason why I decide to uh, ascribe the former as a appropriation from the latter is that on the surface of it, it's a stereotypical uh, description of things of the Chinese. It's like a non-Chinese describing his imagination about China. The pagoda, the flag, uh, everything is actually too Chinese, extremely Chinese. But here's the picture published in 1911, documenting the first air show in China. Now remember the first air show in China took place in 1911 by a French pilot, uh, Renaud Volum in February in uh, 1911. This pictorial published in, in uh, April in the pictorial. The jet is called Summon Plane, S-O-M-M-E-R, Summon Plane. It's uh, the inventor who uh, invented this plane. But what really made uh, such depiction of airplane legitimized and necessary to give a sense of advancement and future to the wild public in Tianjin is the event in March 1917 when the 19-year-old legendary American aviatrix Stinson had her air show in Tianjin, and I guess that is exactly the reason for the gallery to decide to work with the artist to come up with the picture. Even the source of the picture was appropriated from a French journal. Uh, the French journal Le Petit Journal was uh, available in French concession in Tianjin. It was very popular. At its peak, uh, the journal published like uh, over one uh, million a copy for, for one uh, session. As an example of a first encounter with the Western influence, my case study of the New Year picture shows a process, how the Western idea and objects were absorbed on the level of the public. But that, that is not to say Western images first appeared as late as early 20th century, nor Western necessarily means modern. For example, you can ascribe art like this to Western style, uh, but modernity. You can't say this is a modern art, right? Uh, this is a work by the missionary Castelloni for the Chinese emperor, uh, Qianlong. Castelloni was hired by Qianlong as a court painter and, uh, and uh, uh, architect. He was the architect for the, for the uh, old summer palace. Or something like this. This is the first ever recorded uh, Chinese oil painter, Lin Gua. Gua in Cantonese means painter or Guan Chao Chang. Its name. It's not modern art. It's oil painting, but it's not modern art. Okay. So now I, the first decade of the, of, of the 20th century marked the end of the insular traditional bound Qing Empire, the last empire uh, from 1644 to 1911. 
and the forceful entry of China into the uh, modern age. Foreign influence is largely restricted to a handful of ports and missionaries' initiatives during much of the 19th century, now flooded into China in an irresistible tide. Indeed, the massive influx of Western ideas and products constituted the most important factor defining China's culture during the uh, 20th century. So now I want to uh, analyze two tendencies, two main tendencies of modern art uh, for the first half of the 20th century before 1949 when uh, People's Republic of China was found. Uh, one of them, one of the tendencies is represented by the figure Xu Beihong. Uh, his influence uh, is very long lasting, even today. Xu Beihong went to France, went to Paris uh, to study realism and uh, academicism in 1919. Now, look, the year 1919 is, is, is a little tricky for the art world. For the art world even in Paris because 1919 uh, it was what's popular in Paris was a fauvism was uh, something like uh, abstract art or impressionism instead of uh, academism or uh, realism naturalism naturalism realism and academism were on decline by the time he went to Paris but instead of uh, following suit for the modern artist, he decided to study academicism and realism. Some of his paintings, by the way, after that, he came back to China and he eventually became the first president of CAFA, Central Academy of Fine Art, the most important art academy in China. That's where I, I got my uh, MA from. That is a painting uh, on the left, his self-portrait, and then there's a picture he with the, uh, the Indian poet, Tiger. And that is a portrait of a young lady, Mrs. Jenny. So basically, sorry. So basically, okay. He has two uh, ways of a painting. He has a two kinds of a styles. One is uh, he adapted traditional Chinese subject with Western style, like Western historical uh, oil painting tradition. He combined and integrated these two, two, two traditions. The other is his uh, Chinese, uh, tr more traditional materially, um, Chinese uh, wa wash and ink painting, like the horse, that's what he is mostly famous for. But if you look closely at his horses, you will see uh, it's light, the light and the shade factors elements are appropriated from the Western painting instead of traditional Chinese painting. That's not 100% China, Chinese painting. And he used the Western techniques like a shading, like a figurative art uh, tricks, like a, a perspectives to depict Chinese stories or, or from fables from uh, uh, literary uh, subjects. His, his far reaching impact appear even today for uh, college entrance examination. If you want to be, if you want to go to Kappa, you are supposed to paint a picture uh, in the in the in 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 this way. So it's a basic uh, art education. And he modified, he transformed the way uh, art education. In sharp contract with uh, Mr. Xu Bei Hong is uh, Mr. Lin Feng Mian. Uh, he adopted, instead of uh, realism and academicism, he adopted a modern style, like a fauvism, uh, to Chinese traditional literary subjects. He went to France the same year with Mr. Xu Beihong in 1919. But that's Mr. Lin Fengmian in the middle. But he paints in this way. Yeah, uh, that's 
what's on the poster, right? And the poster of my lecture is a work by Mr. Lin Fengmian. He combined classical Chinese stories or classical uh, literature stories with uh, a style fauvism. Even though his style is uh, compared with Matisse, it's, a, it's a more uh, primitive, it's not that mature, but he is a really experimentator uh, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, that's his work, Mr. Lin Fengmian. See, it's a traditional Chinese uh, painting in the, in the spirit, but the color is totally uh, from a Western style. With the, with the founding of the People's Republic of China uh, on October 1st, 1914, uh, 1949, cultural activities came under the control of the state, seeking to reform traditional uh, painting to make it serve the people, serve the country. The communist uh, government uh, mandated that artists pursue a revolutionary realism uh, that would celebrate the heroism of the common people to convey the majesty of the motherland, taking the socialist realism of the Soviet Union as orthodoxy. Chinese painters found a model among their own uh, countrymen emulating the Western derived academic realism of Mr. Xu Pei Hong, uh, painting from rather than copying ancient masterpieces became the principal source of inspiration for most uh, artists. Even now, for a college entrance examination, you are supposed to paint um, a model for three hours. This influence from Soviet Union or former Soviet Union or USSR uh, started in the, in the 1950s. This is a work by Levin, by the celebrated uh, uh, Russian painter Levin, and this is a work by Surikov. So, you know, during the so-called Sino-USSR honeymoon years, uh, the former Soviet Union sent a lot of uh, called foreign experts to China in, in industrial sector, economy sector, and in art sector. In 1955, uh, the former Soviet Union sent this artist, Maximov, to China, to Kafa, Central Academy of Fine Art, to establish a uh, so-called Maximov oil painting class. This class is so influential for later Chinese art education and defining factor for uh, Chinese uh, mainstream art or the official Chinese art. But he himself, to be honest, is not, I would say, first class artist. He, I would say he is a second tier artist, but maybe he's an excellent art educator. To, to show the profile of this class, this is not a graduation of, of Central Academy of Fine Art. This is a graduation ceremony just for his class. Who is in the middle is the military general, Zhu De. So that shows the profile of this, of this class. And this is Mr. Jing Shangyi. He later became president of Kafa and uh, chairman of the uh, Society of Chinese Art. That Chinese artist, and that's uh, the biggest art society in, in, in China. And he kept uh, being president of CAFA from the year 1988 up to 2001 for many years. That's Mr. Jing Shangyi's work. But most of the most of the works done uh, in the revolution in the uh, influence of uh, uh, style of a former. Soviet Union are revolutionary, legendary heroes and heroines, like five heroes on Langyang Mountain, or uh, revolutionary uh, worker rebellions, something like that. We would still see the modern uh, subject and object in art during the uh, cultural revolutionary, uh, cultural uh, revolution uh, period from 1966 to 1976. And we could see how traditional Chinese uh, painting techniques is adapted 
uh, to uh, to answer the call of the new propaganda uh, uh, subject and how traditional Chinese techniques were adapted to the new call uh, to serve the new the new regime. See the image of air jet again, but in the traditional uh, ink and wash painting, but it doesn't look like Chinese painting, traditional Chinese painting at all. This is another print. Uh, by the way, this picture of uh, Chairman Mao is the most mostly reprinted picture ever in human history before the digital age. It's printed on objects, on, on everything. Heroes, revolutionary heroes and heroines. <laughs> followed, followed by the, uh, the death of Mao in uh, 1976, the economy, the economic reform started two years later in 1978. There emerged the first group of uh, artists in southwestern China in Sichuan province to paint subject either lamenting their youth in the countryside or in a reflective tone to rethink their personal experiences uh, and recent history of the country. This picture by Cheng Chonglin shows uh, the reopening of universities right after the Cultural Revolution with young students wasted a, a decade of youth, their youth on the countryside mm -hmm. now so eager to uh, for Thursday and eager for knowledge. So they are, they are attending class at college classes, which is very different from today. When I give a lecture at the college, you will see students playing with their gadgets, their cell phones. <laughs> so I think this is the really the best time of, of, of education. Uh, anyways, and some artists adopted contemporary Western style to express their own ideas. And sometimes the message is very different from their uh, Western counterpart, like Mr. Luo Zhonglis' father, this picture is called the father. The face in the photorealistic style is an impoverished Chinese farmer. And this causes a big controversy at that time uh, in the year 1980. It sends out a sorrow and critical tone that after even after 30 years of the People's Republic of China, farmers were still poor were still in a disadvantaged situation. But the style he borrowed belonged to the American photorealist Chunk Close. Chunk Close. He used this style, photorealist, I mean hyper, you can call it hyperrealist or, or high resolution uh, uh, oil painting. He used the style to as a way to express the isolation and indifference in the post-industrial uh, commercial society. This is a work, self-portrait of Chang Close, but they express totally different feelings. And there are artists by the, called the Scar Group to you know, lament their youth, their lament their personal uh, uh, disastrous uh, experience during the cultural uh, revolution. Uh, what brought the change to Chinese modern art took place in uh, 1979 when a group of Chinese self-organized, originally underground Chinese avant-garde artists appeared uh, to organize the show right outside Namok. Namok is National Museum for Art. Um, the highest imposition of the official uh, art system, Namok in Beijing. I don't know if uh, Mr. Yubi Borja has ever visited Namok in, in Beijing. No, I don't think so. a, oh, you should next time. It's a gigantic building with uh, lots of exhibition rooms. That's the official uh, art uh, exhibition uh, palace, you could say. 
So, but this exhibition was kind of illegal uh, at that time. So it took place outside on the east side of Namok uh, National Museum of Art. When a group of artists exhibited their uh, abstracts, their sculptures, their prints, just on the walls of, of uh, the east side of Namok. And uh, see, these are the uh, documentary photos of that uh, exhibition is called the Star Group, okay, the Star Group. They are the first generation of Chinese avant-garde uh, artists. Most of them are now in uh, Western countries in Europe. For example, Wang Keping is uh, in Paris. Li Shuang is, is in Paris in Fontainebleau. Uh, and this is a work by uh, Wang Keping. This very unorthodoxy. So it was not allowed to uh, have an exhibition in uh, Namok. And this is Mr. Huang Rui. He had announcements before the exhibition. The banner uh, behind him is for the freedom of art, for the freedom of art. Now, this uh, really made a, a bigger controversy is uh, in 1979, Mr. Yuan Yunsheng, he's a teacher at Central Academy of Fine Art, was invited to make a mural painting for Terminal 1 of Beijing's International Airport. And he, this is his plan. He come up with something called uh, Water Sprinkling Festival. It's a, it's a kind of a festival for the Dai uh, majority, uh, minority in, in, in China. There are 56 minority groups in China, right? And this is their festival. But it causes a big controversy because of the nude figures in it. Now think, it doesn't look anything special now, but right after the Cultural Revolution with the uh, nude pictures in a public has become the backdrop for millions of uh, pictures. It's just a controversy. And then <laughs> the official decided to cover it with, uh, with uh, some cloth and then, you know, reopened. So the combination, the combination of this avant-garde spirit or movement is called the 1985 new wave or 85 new wave with a shocking uh, event with a, with a pistol fire shooting in Namok in 1989. I'm talking about the Urban Guard show in early 1989 when the women artist Xiao Lu shot fire at a telephone booth in Namok. The whole thing, the telephone booth, the, sh the shooting, are part of her a part of her performance art, but actually, she instead of a political message, she only expressed her personal issue with a with a male, her father's uh, a friend, uh, who uh, harassed her during her youth. But that event brought an end to the to the big show because that um, caused the police uh, intervention. And what's on the show are something like this. So we could see classical Western iconographies are appropriated and readjusted to express a new sense for the new era in China. This is a gigantic oil painting by Mr. Meng Luding and Zhang, Zhang, Zhang Qun. It's called In the New Era, The Revolution of Adam and Eve. The red apples on the plate of the woman are symbols, traditional, traditionally symbols of in, enlightenment and, and the knowledge. So really the artists try to express the feeling of uh, farewell to a new age, to, a, to an old age and the welcoming of a new era. There are uh, other artists who combined the Western contemporary art style with a Chinese uh, subject like this one. Now, this is a work by uh, Mr. Wang Guangyi, Wang Guangyi, a standard propaganda uh, picture you could see on posters during the Cultural Revolution, but he integrated with uh, advertisements of uh, Pepsi. And uh, this, 
with uh, uh, Marlboro advertisement. This this really caused into the mind of uh, Andy Warhol. So he's he's kind of Chinese Andy Warhol. And then the artist um, following suit of the international uh, contemporary uh, art style, like uh, Zhang Huan. He's uh, I think now he's based in both New York and Beijing, performance artist. Uh, this one, for this one, he stand in an anonymous lake outside of Beijing. And this is uh, one of his uh, arts projects. He uh, used a train wreck from an accident. Uh, I think this work was done like uh, 10 years ago at the UCCA in Beijing uh, 798 Art District. And there are artists who challenge the orthodoxy uh, consciousness. Like Mr. Ma Liu Ming, he's a man, but uh, admittedly he has some uh, feminine beauty. He intended to blur the sexual boundaries. This is uh, on his sides are uh, the artist group Gerbot and George. They are uh, gay couples, they are famous. Uh, performance artist from England. Uh, in the 1990s, when these two artists visited Beijing and to, you know, did an uh, excursion to the artist village, and Ma Liu Ming um, set a, a chicken above his head and make it bleeding when these two artists came close to, to him and uh, he asked his friend to shoot this picture. So the pic this work or this picture is called Ma Liu Ming with Jill Bot and George. This is Ma Liu Ming now. He's like put on some weight 10 years ago outside the Louvre. Well, the rise of Chinese art market has given birth to a number of art celebrities on the international art stage. One of them, of course, is Mr. Cai Guoqiang. Cai Guoqiang is the one play with a fire. He literally, he plays with fire. This is his uh, firework. He puts fire powders on the huge scroll of a painting, and then, I don't know, like, through some special technique, he blowed it. He's the one who designed the firework for the opening ceremony of the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. He designed 29 uh, big footsteps here. And he's the one uh, designed, I think all of the fireworks for official big ceremonies and events. So he works closely with the uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, big events and stadium with the government. And there are, see, fireworks. So he's a firework master. It's a studios in New York, and uh, mm -hmm. all right. And there are art, other artists who um, try to integrate a, a Western installation with uh, some traditional Chinese characters, like uh, Mr. Xu Bing. Xu Bing uh, used to be vice president of a Kafa, and now he's a he's a professor at the Kafa. He's based in New York and Beijing. That's his uh, work. He got famous for called a book from heaven. Uh, all of these characters, they look Chinese characters, but they are not readable because he dismantled part of the character to form unrecognizable characters, but they look Chinese. Um, and he, you may recognize this because it's English. That's English. Can you read it? <laughs> no. It's called English calligraphy. This is A, this is B, this is I, um, this is a T, this is a but, B U T, B U T. See the trick is? Yes. And this is in, but in, I, N. On the surface, it, it looked like a Chinese calligraphy, but he used. Uh, English words to stylish, restylish Chinese uh, English English uh, words, and another yeah English calligraphy, 
And another of his work is um, called As There's Nothing from the First, Where Does the Dust Collect Itself? It's a Zen verse. Xu Bing used the, you know, the dust from 911 terrorist attack. You know, 911 terrorist attack in New York. He collected this yeah. dust and every time he lose a bit of it you when know, he had an exhibition. But there are some countries that doesn't allow people to bring in earth. What he did, he made the dust into mud and made a, something like a teddy bear and brought it in the country and dry it and, and made his work. Uh, here's another, his, his more recent work is called Book from the Earth. Uh, this picture really shows, this work really shows the experience we're having now. We're taking in information, right? Nowadays, instead of words, uh, but images, we read images more instead of words. He used uh, public signs to come up with a narrative, like the sun rises, it's seven o'clock, I set the alarm seven o'clock, I got up a bed and I turn off the light or I turn on the light, it sees, oh, it's a seven. So I ran to the airport, ah, to catch up the uh, 11 o'clock right. flight to, had a shower, had a shower and brush his tooth and put on the clothes and then go to the, maybe the toilet, had a coffee and a fried egg, you can read it. So it describes an experience that we read pictures more. So how, how much information we get in through words nowadays instead of, um, instead, of, uh, instead of pictures. And lastly, I wanna introduce a, uh, a uh, very famous artist now, uh, Mr. Qiu Zhijie. He's he's just another representative of Chinese contemporary artist on the on the international art stage. I'd say he's very shrewd and very even cunning. He's a shrewd art operator because he's so good at romantizing Chinese imagination uh, in the international art market and the logic constituted by commercial galleries, museums, auction houses, art fairs, and all kinds of art biennales, triennales. For example, he made sculptures of, of mythical creatures from the Chinese uh, mythology book, Legends of Mountains and Seas, or, nice. or Boda figures but to have them show in the Italian commercial gallery in Beijing in seven and eight art district. In another work of his, he just opposed the cartoon character Elmo. Do you know Elmo? Elmo is like a character of a Sesame Street English class or a cartoon character, Elmo, with uh, some of his books. One of them is a, a classical book here. Uh, on contemporary art criticism called the critical terms for art history. And there are terms like context, image, gender, all the Western ideas applied to, uh, like Mr. Yuri Bolch just mentioned, to talk about contemporary uh, art today, including Chinese contemporary art, which shows again how shrewd he is uh, at applying the international rules to achieve his his, his own art goal and personal goals. But on the other hand, um, which also shows the globalization of the cultural uh, section today, uh, which includes definitely contemporary Chinese art. So uh, that's it for my lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, please welcome. And Yes, thank you, Dr. Liang. And if you do have the uh, questions and also you have the uh, curiosity about today's lecture, you can switch on your voice and ask Mr. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Liang. So basically, I very much agree with uh, the idea of Mr. E.V. Borch that uh, contemporary art or modern art are, are not about all of these big ideas, big words, yeah. Well, uh, if, can I? Yes. Uh, if I might sure. um, relate to 
first of all, it was a very interesting lecture. Um, Thank you. In the sense that uh, it is also very modern in approach. Um, as there is so much difference between what we call the masters and modern art, whether contemporary or less contemporary. I think um, uh, there is a, a great problem of identity today because in modern art, there is more protest than there is beauty or ugliness. Um, possibly the modern artist is reacting to the destruction of the environment in, in different ways, naturally, because every person has a different character and reacts differently. Um, and so in art, in contemporary art, there is a sense of um, dissolution. There is a sense of an explosion. And what we used to think about art, about bravura and virtuosity and the talent of technique is no longer applied. Applicable, right. And naturally, from what I saw recently, in fact, I uh, was invited to introduce Ding, Ding Lee's art at, at um, St. James Cavalier in Valletta. Um, one cannot say that modern art, contemporary modern art, is a break from the past. Because, for example, in Ding Li, there is a lot of calligraphy. There is a lot of collage of using um, um, found objects. And what I would like to suggest is that we cannot uh, relate to modern art if we don't relate to tradition, to to um, this wisdom of the past. Because as Henry Moore says, art is a continuous expression. Yeah. But, but, but really, is modern art really, really want to be a continuous expression from the past? Or is the modern artist trying to break so much from the past that instead of creating God, he's creating something else. In fact, when we use the word painting, it is very difficult to um, use, the, apply the word to certain, for example, um, installation. Installation is not really painting. And so you cannot, uh, relate the two. Um, one perhaps uh, needs to um, give, a, 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 give a, a, a meaning to a word. Uh, you cannot just use uh, traditional words used in art 10 years, 20 years ago to what uh, artists are, are producing. I, I think there is a, a paradox. Uh, probably mm -hmm. a man has lost, has lost himself in this jungle that we have created. Uh, possibly modern art is a reaction uh, to dissolution of life as we knew it, the family, um, nature, the beauty of nature. For example, uh, if I might mention this, uh, during Impressionist times, which is not recent, naturally, uh, the beauty of the sky 
was pollution, really, <laughs> not, not uh, air that you could breathe uh, and relax. You were breathing poison. And in painting, it used to look beautiful because of the gases there, there was in the sky. I mean, this is the paradox. What can we yeah. make of modern art? That is the question. Yeah, I always think, yeah, thank you very much for your comments. And uh, that is the reason why I decided to study American modern art in the 20th century. Actually, I just found uh, even modern art, uh, the breaking, the total breaking with the past itself is a modernist idea, right? But in actual, in reality, art can never uh, be. How can we break with the, with the past if the past is, impossible. is our life? Because the past right. continues in the present, and the present yeah. is part of the future. The present, while I'm speaking, it becomes the past. Yeah, but like I showed in the, in my, the lecture, right? Yes, yeah, sorry. Like I showed in the lecture, the traditional Chinese painting technique is 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 uh, still continued even during the Cultural Revolutionary years. Yes, I right? understand. It's just the change of a form, and now you will see the uh, uh, re recurring of traditional Chinese art. Uh, I mean, yes, breaking up itself is a part of the. It's a part of the modernist uh, narratives. The, the, the art of Ding Li, for example, yeah. Uh, yeah. is yeah. rooted in the past. It is very yeah. modern, but he um, exploits um, even past techniques. I would like to mention Pollock, because mm -hmm. just a few months ago... Um, Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock uh, technique was studied, and today we are calling his expressionism fractal expressionism. Um, mm. Scientists tried using his method of um, throwing paint onto canvas, you know, as a as a natural process, as a reaction, as a as a uh, automatic movement. And mm -hmm. they found that to uh, produce his art, you cannot hold uh, the can with the paint too high or too low, because when you throw it, it uh, forms into uh, a kind of, um, uh, a kind of circle. Uh, mm. uh, not only one circle, but a series of circles. And this has made me think a lot because e even action, um, automatic action has been exploited in modern art. I, I like Pollock's art because I used to go uh, to uh, the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in mm -hmm. Venice and they had <clears throat> a whole hall of his art. Oh. Now no longer because they are using the hall for other uh, other la other works. But e even now, looking back, Pollock lo looks old in a way. Uh, th this is the paradox. I, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> there is so much to think about what man is doing today. So much. Because oh, art, is about for... art is about reflection. Uh, I would like to end this way. I don't think art is about understanding because there is no understanding of art. It is about emotion. It is about feeling. It is about a physical thing rather than a mental, um, a, a mental approach. Uh, probably this emotional part is is not being exploited enough in modern art. It has become too much of a, 
there's a special word that I need. It's too uh, much of... Uh, intellectual. Yes, it's too much intellectual because it is not about, about the beauty of this material, of this texture, it, but it's about, a, it's a more about the protest, information, a, knowledge. a social yeah. protest. Mm -hmm. But should mm -hmm. that be only a social protest? Shouldn't it be the beauty of, of man, even the because there is beauty in ugliness. I, I, I love it, so it, many it, the paintings that you showed, which were so expressionist, but which looked like the art of great masters. I was, I'm referring to Russian and Chinese paintings that you showed. I really enjoyed your lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I always feel that uh, showing people something is the human nature. Like my kid, he like for 25 hours a day, he always wants me to see what he's made and what he wants to show me. You know, he keeps asking me to take a look at him, to look at his work. You know, I think definitely um, showing is a, is a part of the human nature. It's a man's innate tendency. Yes, yes. To express, to show something, you know, if you if you just observe uh, yes. uh, kids, yeah. Yes, man. Well, yes, perhaps I can conclude uh, by saying that man has always been an exhibitionist. Yes, not just, yes. Not just two thousand. Not not just two thousand two thousand years no. ago. No, but no, now no, we no, know no. that. Yeah. Man has been an exhib exhibitionist even fifty thousand years before Christ, yes. and the more yeah. that we, the more we excavate, the more archaeology becomes a science. Uh, we really understand why man loved so much to dance, why he loved yeah. sound so much, why he loved to sing like a bird, especially the Chinese song yeah. is the song of birds. Uh, I think this is what art is about. Uh, this um, projection of man's feeling, of man's emotion. And I think art is such, is so much beautiful that it can unite mankind and not create war. This is Right. should be the basis of studying art. Thank you. Thank you. More questions or, or comments? Uh, you're welcome to. I, I I'm want ready to. to... Yeah, yes, would... please. Yes, I would like to thank you. It was very interesting. Um, thank you. I, I never knew all this information about Chinese art, <laughs> I have to admit. <laughs> And it was yeah. very interesting to see the change, the, the, how, how art changed throughout the years, Chinese art, how it changed throughout the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at first, how the paintings were with the different colors and slowly um, the, the evolution, you know, of the Chinese art. I, I was impressed. It was very interesting. And thank, thank you, you for the opportunity, you know, for giving us the opportunity to, to listen and to see the pictures as well and to learn more. Yeah, thank you. I, actually, I, I only um, just to give a very uh, primitive outline of, of what is gone through in the art in 20th century China. It, there are um, other tendencies uh, like how ink and wash evolved in the 20th century, but because of the time limit, I didn't really um, got the chance to elaborate it on. So I, I picked up some, you know, just the two tendencies uh, represented uh, respectively by Mr. Uh, Lin Fengnian and Mr. Uh, Xu Beihong. Yeah. Um, at a more chance, I, I, I'd love to uh, send you uh, more pictures of uh, outstanding Chinese modern art. It's a very yes. exciting uh, journey of, of art. Yes. And, maybe. Um, yeah. Maybe we could have another lecture in the future as a continuation to this. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank we're, you for your uh, curiosity. Yes. <laughs> it would be interesting yeah. to learn more, you know, about Chinese art and. Thank and, you. Yes.
And uh, especially now when uh, we'll see that uh, the COVID-19, you know, it's a, like a testimony of uh, human being is like a totality. You know? I mean, of course, in a, not in a pleasant way, but it shows that in terms of culture, economy, it's, it's a, a, a totality of humanity. So, so his art, like you will see uh, Chinese artists acted anywhere else in, in America, in Europe, and they all have some, some influences from their innate uh, cultural background and uh, they keep absorbing in um, new modern and contemporary Western influences. It's like a chemical, I would say, it's a, a, a chemical effect instead of a physical one. I don't know if you see what I mean. Yes. The yes, integration cause... of different culture has become a more and more uh, uh, chemical. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Yes, I would like it if, if you'd have more lectures. <laughs> it would be very interesting to follow. Thank you very much. Yeah. I really yes, love I Yes, I think with the with the permission of the China Cultural Center, Malta, I think we should repeat uh, this event. And uh, I agree with this comment by Sabrina de Bono that your lecture was revealing. Naturally, you couldn't, you, you had to concentrate, say, on two points, but that's how we should start. Uh, you made us think, and I think we should repeat the event. Thank you. That is thank my you wish. Your, thank you for your uh, hospitality. And uh, I will uh, share in if, uh, if uh, the documentary adopted for my, uh, my uh, research is put on display, I think uh, either the end of this year or early next year, uh, played on CCTV9, I will share it uh, about my research on New Year painting. They, they could make it more um, active and uh, more enjoyable if it's put, on, put in the form of a documentary film. Thank you. It, it could be also a dialogue, say, uh, we present them pictures and from European art and mm -hmm. you prepare them pictures on Chinese art and, dis and discuss them. Uh, yeah, that's, with, that's a very good our, idea. With our listeners, for example. This is only an idea that came to mind yeah, yeah. just now. I love it. I love the idea. I love the idea. Yeah. Thank you very I think much. Good, good art is, is about uh, revealing things. And uh, yeah, yeah, I really enjoy it. And uh, in this way, it's, uh, it's my first time. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if I made any mistakes or, or because of the interference of, of my kid. <laughs> I really enjoyed it and hope to hope I could, uh, see you in person uh, in the near future. Hopefully. Yeah, we'll... Hopefully, yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> any... um, can I say something, please? Uh, sure, if please. there is a continuation of these lectures, can they be in the evening? Because many people are at work in the morning. Um, oh. Okay. Sure. I've, had, I've had comments from our ADG members saying, you know, they can't attend because of work. Okay, okay. Perhaps we you may take up the suggestion. Yeah, it makes, it makes sense. sense. It makes sense, yes. Because right uh, now... I, I uh, didn't think about this before, because I would have given advice. I, I really appreciate uh, you spend the uh, uh, morning with me, uh, especially when, when, when people have work to do, and uh, I know it's morning, so I, yes, because... I, I deeply appreciate it. Uh, because today, why we take this time? Because the Dr. Liang has a different time with us because he he is in China and we uh, we are in Mota. And but next time we will concern your questions and your your your, your concerns. And uh, yeah, yes, it makes sense. Makes sense. Yes, makes sense. Much sense. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I you. can upset down my time. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, well, I have already concluded, really, because the main problem with um, modern art is that it, it is, I think, too, 
too disruptive. In what way? Possibly the modern artists are trying to do something that man has never done. But man cannot do something uh, out of the void. He has always to build on what has happened before, because that is life, that is continuity, that is what um, the great uh, Henry Moore English artist said, it is one continuous activity. It, it cannot be just a break. It has to, has a platform and the, and the platform is the past. It is tradition, which is um, all man's wisdom because it is his experience. And naturally art is action. This is very important that art is action. All his artistic language is action, whether painting, sculpture, dance, song, music, it is always action. And at times, possibly, this we forget. Um, I would like to end like this, perhaps I might be very traditional, but what about studying again the great masters instead, instead of trying to go, get away from them, mentioning only two, say, Rembrandt and Rubens, or mention, say, Michelangelo, Leonardo and Raffaello. Why are we so afraid of, of these great masters? What are we trying to do today? To forget them? I don't know. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. You cannot be so sure. Yeah, so, uh, Dr. Leon, do you have any okay. to, uh, comments or you, you want to give some concludes or? Well, I, um, I very much uh, appreciate uh, that people attend this lecture in this way um, during their work hours. And uh, it's really enjoyable to uh, work again with the China Culture Center. And uh, I hope to uh, literally to see you again uh, in, the, in the near future. Yeah, when this pandemic is over. Yeah. Okay. So, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great day for me. Yeah, thank you for uh, organizing this event and for uh, inviting me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Leon, and thank you, uh, Mr. Evie Borch, uh, attending today's lecture, and thanks all of you attending uh, the, uh, the lecture today, and we, we really hope that you enjoy this lecture. And uh, yes, we think we will, we will arrange this kind of lecture in the future with Dr. Dr. Liang, for sure. So thank you very much, and I hope you all thank of you. you have the weekend. Good weekends. Thank Go you, Lausha. Go thank you.